LinkedIn, remove. So LinkedIn is creating some problems, so I'm just taking it away. All right. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Good morning. Hello. Good evening. Good afternoon. You know, we are uh, in different time zones, different part of the world. Uh, I'm Abdul Samad Khan, the founder and CEO of Youth Impact. And uh, right now it's 12 p.m. Uh, in Pakistan, and uh, we welcome all of you to a cup of tea. Act. Act is. Uh, uh, it used to be our monthly meetup of our alumni and our guest speakers uh, across the eleven different destinations in Pakistan. Uh, thanks to COVID nineteen, that uh, you know we got to explore this wonderful opportunity to benefit from uh, international experts and to bring them on board to share their insights with. Uh, youth impactors in Pakistan and across the world. So today, this uh, afternoon, I've got uh, two amazing uh, friends and guests. Uh, let me give you a quick uh, overview. On my extreme right, I've got this uh, wonderful lady, uh, Tika. That's her calling name, and uh, we all call her Tika. We met uh, back in 2018, if I'm not wrong. So we, yeah, we were at Southeast Asia Leadership Academy in Sri Lanka. And uh, we were in the same learning group. So Tika came from Indonesia, and uh, we had some great, amazing, uh, almost two weeks together uh, at this beautiful resort in Sri Lanka. So thank you very much, Tika, for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me, Saman. Happy to be here. Yeah, my pleasure. And then uh, this wonderful smiling man in the center. Uh, I have been a great fan of uh, Mark Collard for almost uh, one decade. Uh, when I was in Australia, I tried a lot to meet him. Somehow I couldn't uh, connect. And then we got to meet back in 2015 uh, when I was attending the Association of Experiential Education Conference uh, in Portland, Oregon. So that's where I got to, to attend a session of Mark as well. And then Mark, uh, I've got your uh, copy with me as well. So I'm honored to have uh, this copy of Mark. And Mark, wonderful. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Uh, thank you. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, all those audience who are listening to this conversation, uh, we are, uh, this is our third uh, consecutive a cup of tea. And uh, in this month of Ramadan, uh, we focus uh, uh, on today's conversation, we focus on the future, the future of learning. Uh, because uh, all three professionals uh, in front of you, they are from the learning and development or training and development industry. And uh, as I said, that thankfully, uh, this COVID-19 has uh, on one side, when it created a lot of uh, threats and challenges for humanity, at the same time, it brought in uh, amazing opportunities. You know, uh, I have never imagined that I will be uh, live streaming. I'll be using StreamYard or Zoom and all those amazing platforms which were there for last many years. Um, I mean, uh, we were all forced to uh, unlearn and relearn. And this is the beauty of uh, this whole uh, you know, paradigm where we people who are into learning and development can see opportunities uh, into the dark times. So that's where we'll be focusing our conversation today. And uh, before we uh, go to the topic, I'll, I'm going to request my guests starting from Tika, to give a brief overview about yourself, who you are, where do you come from, and what do you do, and what keeps you busy these days? Yes, Tika. Sure, uh, happy to do it, Sama. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, so I'm Tika, that's short for Kartika, but that's a longer name, so I usually go by Tika, it's very short. Um, yeah. I'm from Jakarta, Indonesia, born and raised. Um, you probably can't hear it from my uh, accent, um, but I enjoy being a multicultural, multilingual person. I love cultures and I love learning uh, languages. Um, I'm a learning and development specialist, and I particularly focus on leadership development. And I did not think it was going to be the issue of leadership development is going to be very different in the course of just a few months. Um, so I've been working all over uh, the country and the region. I do a lot of work in Southeast Asia. 
Uh, I also uh, do some work in a think tank in America called the East West Center. And I'm also affiliated with uh, some other international organizations. My last work of leadership development has been in Singapore and Myanmar. So that's two different countries with very different cultures, both with very different ideas of what good leadership is. So looking forward to this discussion today. Great. This is uh, wonderful. And I'm happy to, uh, you mentioned about your diverse experience because that's where, you know, the young people in Pakistan, uh, they'll be able to benefit more from those who have got very diverse experience. And I'm sure the culture of leadership, the culture of learning and development is absolutely uh, different in Pakistan from different worlds and different aspects and has got a lot of commonalities. We will uh, discover more about it uh, as we go forward. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, Mark Collard, over to you. So, uh, thank you and uh, greetings to all of our viewers and, and listeners. Uh, I'm based in Melbourne, Australia, so I'm a little bit ahead of you all in terms of time. Um, I work uh, as an experiential trainer. I'm also an author of many books and a keynote speaker. I spend a lot of my time on the road, although not presently. Uh, it has been seriously curtailed uh, with the COVID uh, issues. And I'm really excited to share with you what I've discovered um, that's not only adapted, but also created some new opportunities within this new environment. Uh, Playmio is probably best known for hosting a really large, in fact, it's the largest online database of group games and activities. Uh, I had always been a trainer. It's been over 30 years now I've been in this field. I wrote books thinking that was a good way to share. Uh, but what was more powerful was leveraging the use of the internet. And so that people in the palm of their hand now can access anything from the simplest of energizers uh, to a more substantive team event. And there are hundreds and hundreds of activities that I share uh, online, uh, both through our apps, but also the desktop version as well. Um, day to day, uh, I spend a lot of my time curating that content. Um, and I don't think I've ever been busier in 30 years as I have the last two months because uh, my community have been desperate saying, the the presumptive setting is that we turn up in person and suddenly like a carpet being pulled out from underneath our feet that was taken away and so a lot of the effort the last couple of months has been about adapting something that we were used to doing in person to trying to do it online and that's where a lot of my business has been um, but I'm excited to get over that crest and actually start creating something just for online um, that won't be replicated in person. So uh, working as a trainer uh, in many parts of the world, clearly I'm based in Australia, but most of my time is spent in the Northern Hemisphere where most of the people uh, live in this world. Amazing. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. While listening to you, I can hear this uh, optimism, you know, while the rest of the whole world is uh, being worried about this disease and, uh, you know, the uncertainty, the chaos, the uh, loss of business and the... Uh, challenges with economy. So these are the buzzwords which we hear all the time on the news. So I'm, I'm really wondering that what, what keeps you uh, this much positive? What is your source of motivation or inspiration? Uh, Samad, I think for me, it's probably built into the fiber of my genes uh, to be a glass half full kind of person. Um, right. But can I also say that I'm extremely fortunate to live where I do. Australia has had an extraordinary uh, record in managing this health and economic crisis. Uh, for a nation of 26 million people, we don't even have 100 people yet that have died. You know, we've not even crossed that threshold. So it's really quite remarkable. And the government have been able to support us. Uh, many people are out of work, of course. Kids are all being homeschooled, like my son has been all day today with my wife. But I know it's temporary. And with the support of not only my community, but you know, to the level of even my government, uh, I know we'll come out the other side of it even much stronger. So it is a view to the future that helps me feel more positive about now. Uh, amazing. I think the world needs uh, more people like yourself, uh, those who can show the light uh, you know, in this uh, dark tunnel. So I hope we'll get more light, more brightness. Yep. So Tika, Tika, how is it? Uh, how bad is uh, COVID nineteen in Indonesia? Let me ask you in that way. Uh, it's pretty bad, and we won't actually know how bad it is because our testing and data is not as reliable as a lot of the countries. 
Um, yeah. So, well, I think we will not know the extent of how bad it is and the amount of people trusting or not trusting the information that's available from official sources or unofficial sources. That's a huge debate that's happening. So I think you chose this, um, you curated this call quite well, Sama, because I'm sort of the, the very end of the spectrum opposite from Mark. I'm very much a glass half empty kind of person. Mm. Um, um, and in a way, I find that comforting. I find, I find comfort when I'm able to just acknowledge the pain or the hardship that I'm yeah. living in or empathize with um, something that everyone else is, is living in. And, and you know, in, however you see the situation that we live in, I think our role as individuals or as leaders or however you see yourself is that we, we need to be brokers of hope. So however you find that energy in you, you need to be able to channel it and give it to other people. So so Mark's way or, or your way, Saman, in giving hope to others may be different to mine, but we all play a part and it's our role to just broker of hope to, to, mm. so that others will keep going. Mm. Yeah. That's, good. That's wonderful. I mean, um, I had been in, into the same situation for last almost two, two uh, months uh, in Pakistan, uh, it had not very bad, but definitely, you know, the government had take, uh, taken a lot of uh, precautionary measures, mm. which means uh, all the industries, all the businesses, the entire uh, life cycle had been put on halt. And that, you know, uh, initially, a lot of people were uh, challenged with this uh, change in the lifestyle. The kids uh, were stopped from going to schools. They uh, adopted to the online learning systems. When I talked to some of the teachers and the school owners, they themselves were not comfortable that, you know, they don't think uh, that they will be able to achieve that impact. But, you know, as soon as this moved forward, a couple of weeks down, uh, the their mindset and their belief and their, uh, you know, understanding about this whole online learning system, it was changed. And they said, we were amazed by the response of the kids. In my own, they were doing this online working. And I could see that, you know, they were as committed as uh, they were in the school. At the same time, they were more flexible, more adaptable. They knew that they are in the super win of their parents, and uh, which gives them more relaxed environment. So, you know, uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, this whole thing of uh, coming on uh, StreamYard and Zoom and online learning, this was never my forte because I had been a wilderness person spending time in the mountains and deserts and oceans where even we do not get the uh, internet connectivity. So I was just asking myself, can I do this? But, you know, uh, at this age, as I said in the beginning, this is the beauty and this is perhaps the only option that we have to unlearn and relearn. So coming to our uh, topic, which is uh, the future of learning. So my, my question is, uh, you know, how you think that this whole challenge of COVID-19 has, uh, you know, created opportunities for innovative and effective ways of learning. How do you think that people around the world or people in your communities or in your networks are benefiting from learning and development or how they are you know, fulfilling their desire or thirst to educate themselves? What's going on? Hmm. Tika, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, so opportunities um, about, about learning. So I think this theme is very prescient because Actually, the future of learning is already here, but it just arrived really, really prematurely before a lot of us are ready for it. So we've already seen evidence of the future of learning right now. And, you know, uh, acknowledge the pain. There's a lot of frustrations about, you know, moving on into these uh, online tools or uh, homeschooling, remote learning. But the frustrations is just a learning curve. Um, and that's important to keep in mind. Whenever you learn something new, it's always going to be hard. And what we are doing collectively as a learning um, culture is that we are all collectively learning a, a new way of learning, uh, really. So just to keep in mind that it will be uh, difficult for a few moments, but then after you go through uh, the learning curve, I, I really think um, our way of learning will be greatly enhanced and it will be very different. We will not, I think, go back to the kind of learning that we uh, usually experience before COVID-19. Hmm. Yeah, I agree with you. 
Yeah. Mark, do you have any comment on this? Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, there, we will go back. We all know this is short term, whatever length of time you want to give that. There will be a time when we return students to their schools and we're able to go back to our workplaces and so forth. But there will be no status quo. That It will be a new normal, and it's very cliche to say that. But I think during this time, even though we were all force-fed to learn to survive in this new environment, we've discovered a few things about the use of technologies um, that will, I think, leverage our education into the, into the future. For example, we have understood the concept of a flipped classroom for many, many years. And for those who are not familiar, it means that the, the learning is done effectively uh, in terms of the content is done at home. And then you go to school with the experts to actually learn how to apply it. That's called a flipped classroom. And it relies heavily on internet technologies, the ability to access text and video and so forth online at home. Um, well, guess what? <laughs> every, every kid is presently in the middle of a flipped classroom where the parents who are not the experts, goodness knows if they're not the teacher either, are now working with these children based on the content that's been provided by their school or their teacher. And the teachers are discovering that this has been helpful for many kids who maybe in the normal classroom environment don't get it the first time, maybe not even at the second or third time. But of course, when you've got a classroom of kids, you've got to keep the curriculum moving forward and some kids get left behind. But if it takes some kids 10 times to watch that video, they can do that in their own time, at home, whatever that context is. So I think there are elements just like that that will become will come higher up the surface where yeah. suddenly we've got all these resources we've created very hastily. We'll take some time to fine tune them and perhaps embed them in our children's education uh, further down the track. As just one example, Samad. Excellent, uh, wonderful perspective. Just connect, connecting with what you said, uh, how do you see your business uh, in terms of Plemio? Uh, is it uh, normal, going down, going up? Right now, where do you stand right now? Right now, um, it was a stark contrast. I think the last time I actually turned up to do a training was about seven weeks ago, um, and then very quickly okay. shifted. Uh, my entire calendar of training and conferences and travel uh, was wiped, effectively in the, in the space of a week. So that was devastating at one level. A little bit of it has been replaced with people going, oh, can we try and do something online? But a far cry from the entirety. What has been very positive for us is that a big part of our income um, is subscriptions. People become members of our community to access this information. And there was an initial hit that first three or four weeks, people weren't renewing, they weren't signing up and they were canceling. I've never ever seen our subscription telly go backwards, you know, month to month. It always goes up. Well, yeah. in that month of uh, beginning of April, it went massively down, uh, almost 50%. Yeah. However, I can also say happily this week, we've gone above the level we were at before pre-COVID uh, times. Mm -hmm. So yeah. people have now embraced the understanding that this is an online resource that's useful. So still no training, I'm still at home, <laughs> but yeah. uh, I'm able to create and crank out a great deal more content where I used to blog once a week. I'm blogging almost every single day at the moment. There's just so much to share. Uh, wonderful. I'll, I'll just continue this conversation with you, Mark. You know, uh, we being trainers, I've seen a lot of uh, people coming online and uh, doing these uh, uh, pro bono sessions uh, for the yeah. audience, for their followers. Um, do you see uh, sometimes later post COVID this whole phenomena getting into a proper business model as well? Yes, there, there's no doubt. Um, and it's it's fair at the moment. I can remember only running my very first hosted webinar about five weeks ago. And I made oh. so many rookie mistakes. There's no way I would feel comfortable charging for that. And so with all of the other webinars that I've either hosted or been a part of, I've honed my skills in the same way as someone who used to stand in front of a group of people. I shudder to think that people used to work with me 30 years ago going, oh, how did that ever happen, you know? So yes, I believe the commercial imperative will enter and that will shake out a lot of the cowboys and cowgirls from this space where I, I don't know about you, Tika or Samad, but has suddenly everyone become an expert in this space on online learning and are running their own webinar? Uh, it's not possible we could all be experts at the same time. 
Well, interesting. So Tika, how's your expertise of learning and development going these days? What are, how you are trying to engage your audience, your clients? Is there any connection? Is there any business lead you are getting? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so like like Mark, uh, just for going off to what what Mark shared, um, you know, we're going through um, the firm that I'm working with is going through um, the the case of trying to move everything suddenly online. And then once we move, you know, you kind of have to redesign the curriculum. What was once a week of program in class suddenly became four weeks, but yeah. online because yeah. because we move. Because you don't meet face to face as a designer, as a curriculum designer, there's a great temptation to increase the touch points because we don't meet face to face, uh, which I think is what um, a lot of teamwork uh, collaboration tools is also facing that because we don't meet face to face, there's a tendency to over communicate. So I think we need some time to find the right balance, you know, as it's necessarily true that going online means you have to increase the touch points. Um, to that extent, I think another interesting thing that would be a great market for uh, educators um, worldwide is localization of materials. So now, assuming you have access to infrastructure, which is a whole other um, mm. issue, of course, but assuming you have access to internet and electricity, it would feel right now as if a lot of the great institutions are opening up, you know, their classes for the world to see or their the insides of the world to see. But um, now that creates opportunity for the second tier educators to create, to pick and choose material that fits their, the needs, the cultural context, the languages of their communities and reteach that to them. And I think there's great value in doing that. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, Mark, I was wondering, you know, being, being an experiential trainer myself, I used to spend a lot of time uh, in outdoor trainings, and uh, as I said, that you know, we uh, this April onwards, so we were going to launch our camp Himalayas. It was a series of camps for young people uh, focusing on peace building, um, and it was kind of uh, uh, a very intense program. So this whole program has uh, been put on halt because we can't uh, meet uh, for of, uh, the reasons of social distancing. And then I was uh, continuously wondering that you know how. Uh, effective experiential learning could be on virtual medium so mm -hmm. uh, uh, let us uh, learn from you about you know how this virtual medium can maintain the essence of experience and experiential experiential learning while uh, missing the physical touch or contact uh, elements of uh, this whole methodology mm. Samad, uh, that is really present for many people at the moment. It's front and center going, if I run a camp or run a corporate training or I'm a school, the, the, the imperative was always the presumption groups turned up. But let's not confuse turning up with experiential learning, which is a methodology. Uh, you don't actually have to have people in the same space, even the same room, same outdoors, in order to have an experiential learning uh, experience. So uh, one of the issues that for many people, particularly teachers, is being able to facilitate those experiences that they're clearly going to have to, to set up very differently. But the experiential piece, which is the reflection on the learning, can yeah. still occur. And so I know because I run many webinars now, uh, effectively just adapting some of these very popular team building activities to an online or digital context. And Again, they could still just be a game in the same way that if the group turned up in person, that could still just be a game if you don't lay the facilitation or the reflection on the top, which is the experiential piece. So you know, finding ways to uh, reflect with the group to, if for many people know the word debriefing it, um, is still a critical piece. So as a methodology, no change, just the media, the medium in which we facilitate our groups uh, has has now altered. Uh, you know, it makes sense to me when uh, we talk about uh, light mode team building uh, sessions and exercises. But what about those, uh, you know, serious, hardcore, behavioral, transformational experiences that we create in outdoors or that we create in a physical contact setting where yep. we talk, uh, uh, where we, you know, deep dive into someone's uh, personality or help someone's to deep dive within themselves and then uh, build that 
you know, learning to the point where a person starts seeing the mirror. So mm. do you think that element or that component is still valid in this virtual setting? Oh, uh, yes, uh, but for the most part, our infrastructure is not able to support that. Um, I, I won't go into this in too much detail, but just imagine that for every one of your group members who are located remotely throughout anywhere in the world, yeah. all had virtual reality goggles on. Suddenly, yeah. technology allows these people to be in the same space at the same time, and they still have all of those experiences as a human being, although it's clearly not in the same physical sense and that it, they're not in the same room, but they can still climb that rock climb. They can still feel that their heartbeat is beating and things of that nature. So virtual reality is probably another wave further down the track that would really enhance uh, this concept of, if, if you need to, the experience where you, you can't replace the ropes course or the, 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 the paddle down the river, the rock climb. You know, they're difficult to do with what we have at the moment. But I think with VR on its way, that that's going to be a big game changer. Right. Right. Let me, uh, I hope I'll, I'll be experiencing it more and then maybe I'll revert back to you later on sometime to seek mm -hmm. more guidance. Uh, moving to Tika. Uh, Tika, you focus uh, more on leadership development and you work with your clients uh, on, as a leadership consultant. So how, how do you see this virtual uh, learning methodology or uh, medium helping you, facilitating you or creating challenge for you to achieve your goals of leadership development? How is it going? question um so like i said earlier about opening up access so if anything uh, i think some you know institutions are starting to get excited over the amount of webinars that they can do so i'm getting a lot of requests from people that you know previously probably would not have extended in an invite because they assumed that they would have to fly me over to uh, the country destination but now they're saying, you know, can we have you design a one hour course or a six week course? I'm, I'm trying to design a six week course uh, for um, uh, fresh graduates uh, in Myanmar. And that's an opportunity I would not have had to do, have, have been able to do if it weren't for sure. this time. So that's the other thing, too, is that um, educators and learners suddenly find themselves with a great deal amount of time, more time than they know what to do with. So the what I, what I try to do whenever we talk about you know uh, what learning looks like now is to incorporate your boredom and find different ways of learning that would keep you interested and uh, remember to you know uh, vary your uh, your kinds of learning so you might like to watch a webinar or an online course but then make sure you also spend time to read a book or listen to a podcast or do something with your hands. Um, um, learn to cook, you know, all of these are, so it's the, the like leadership learning or like leadership development, it's hard to know whether you're have successfully learned leadership. So right now it's hard to know whether you have successfully learned because education looks very different to what we used to know, but keep at it because you'll feel yourself grow. And that's, that's really all you need. Um, Tika, uh, continuing on this conversation, I have this uh, concern from some of my fellows in this learning and development industry uh, that, you know, uh, this online learning, it's going to its climax and there will be a time where people will be, you know, uh, might get sick of all this online uh, content consumption that, you know, they're consuming, consuming all the time, but they do not get an opportunity, at least for next couple of uh, months or weeks where they can apply their leadership skill or where they can test whatever they've learned. So don't you think this creates uh, at some time when it reaches its threshold, it may uh, create that frustration as well. And people might get into the negative mode and switching off their webinars and then might be switching off uh, to the offline activities. Do you think this happening somewhere? Um, whether they will shift back to offline activity would probably depend on also how they see the pandemic. And um, that's the thing is also the world is starting to see that the COVID is the pandemic is turning a corner. So people are cautiously looking at the near future and hoping that they could revert back to offline activities. 
Um, that's certainly one of the ways to see this frustration as being supported. Um, and I agree wholeheartedly with your uh, point about consumption, frustration, exhaustion, um, and, and all of that. I, I highly recommend people also to remember to create something um, when you're finishing, you know, make sure you split your time between consuming something and creating something. Even if you write notes about what you learn or write notes about what you did that day, if you try to record yourself saying, explaining a concept to other people, um, that sort of uh, different ways would kind of help uh, lead away the frustration. Now, another thing you said about the leadership frustration is certainly true. You, you just have to watch my sister um, works in a large multinational company, and I was sitting in when they were having a virtual town hall with the CEO that was newly appointed. So this newly appointed CEO has had to address their entire staff in this time, and they have to, you know, he has to walk that delicate line of being hopeful, but also cautioning people that um, the business business will be hard and sacrifices will have to be made. So. Certainly, there's no shortage of challenges of, of being a leader at this time, and anyone who's had to convince their team to stay motivated while remote working would definitely be in this in this uh, in this part. Um, so, I think also another um, another movement that would go up is is mentoring, group coaching, communities of practice. So, I see more of managers sort of if they can have a, a space to sit together and talk about the frustrations with the team, just acknowledging the pain, that is one way for you to be present and try to move one day at a time. All right. So, you know, considering this uh, whole challenge versus opportunity paradigm, you know, I'm sure uh, based on this whole conversation we had right now in the last 30 minutes, I can see both of you are the strong advocates of uh, uh, taking it as an opportunity. So, uh, you know, how, how would you advise the young people, especially because at Youth Impact, our prime audience is the youth of Pakistan and rest of the world. So how would you, uh, you know, advise the young people uh, to, you know, benefit from this whole opportunity? What are those key points uh, where, you know, once this whole COVID-19 is over, uh, when they look back, they say, yes, I had got this uh, wonderful, you know, um, investment or utilization of my time. So what are those two, three uh, quick tips or advices which young people should keep in, in their heart, in their mind, put it on their diary or put it on their wall. Day in, day out, they need to remind themselves, don't miss your time, don't lose your time. This is something you must achieve in next one month or two months or onwards. Hmm. So yeah, any gems? Uh, Samad, there's probably two things that quickly come to mind. Uh, one is, I call it the Netflix effect. You know, you've yeah. just lost your job or school's now at home and you can do your work pretty quickly. You could just put your feet up and watch a whole series of movies. Um, and, you know, I understand that. It sounds like you're on a bit of a break and possibly not even being paid. So, you know, why would you do anything else? Except the ones that will actually come out the other end of this will be the ones who invested their time wisely. So find opportunities to learn something new. It's possible that, you know, you've got a lot more time up your sleeve and if you have and you know, are blessed with the ability to access things through the internet or otherwise, you find this time to actually you know, invest in your skills. So when you come out the other side, you can leverage those. Uh, the other one is, and I haven't touched on this, the, the concept of the virtual meeting. A lot of people say, oh, what do I do? You know, we have to meet virtually. We have to do online learning. They think it's like a very different way of people meeting. However, in all cases, whether they're in person or online in remote locations, intentionality of building connections is still absolutely critical. So my advice to young people is, because you are, that that's a big part of your world, is your community, is to be able to continue to reach out. And so find opportunities to bring people together. You don't have to profit from it, but continue to build skills yeah. so that you can continue to connect. I was just speaking with a family uh, friend today who's teenagers, you know, have been now home school for the last two months and they couldn't even get out of bed this morning. They were so desperately missing their friends and their social contact. Um, yeah. And the school hasn't facilitated that, sadly. 
So young people, there's, there's a great opportunity. Reach out, help one another as much as you will be helped in that situation at the same time. Amazing. Uh, just let me share uh, some insight before I ask the same question to Ika. You know, at Youth Impact, we do this uh, uh, annual youth leadership conference called Markhor. Markhor is the national animal of Pakistan. And we do this uh, camp up in Himalayas. And uh, these young boys and girls in the age of 17 to 24, they are trained to be young social leaders. Now, they went back. They are from all across Pakistan. And uh, uh, two weeks back, we just, uh, you know, called every single alumni of Markhor. There are like 629 alumni. And out of them, 201, 201 they participated in this survey. And uh, the data we gather was, you know, mind-blowing for us. Uh, uh, the You know, picking up what you said, you know, building connections, Mark. You mm -hmm. know, uh, we found that these 201 young boys and girls in the age of 17 to 24, uh, they were able to raise uh, almost, uh, let me convert into US dollars, almost 100,000 US dollars uh, to create, uh, to bring or to buy food for the uh, 11,438 poor families in Pakistan. So, you know, most of this work was based on their connections. They were sitting, mm -hmm. Uh, on their computer, on their phone, their WhatsApp, their, you know, social media uh, connections. And they were just reaching out to the people. And then there is someone like Youth Impact or some other organizations who are just channelizing this whole uh, effort, who are into the field doing some action. So the whole money is pulled up to the to those organizations or people. They are into the field. They get the money and make sure that the poor and needy people get the food and all the necessities. So mm -hmm. this was just a little uh, example. When we got this data, I was just amazed that, you know, I said, wow, perhaps this is uh, why we are doing this whole work and we should keep doing it for rest of the life if, uh, you know, these young people get this kind of inspiration from uh, this kind of program. And this all happened because uh, of the power of this connection, which we which they've got on the social media, which we thought that you, we underestimate. We thought that the connection is just the physical one. Unless you sit together, you party, you talk to each other, you meet each other, uh, there's no connection. So this whole paradigm change of connections and reaching out to people. I myself, I had uh, been able to reach out to those people I had never, you know, talked for last couple of years. And this was that reflection time where we get this opportunity. So Tika, mm -hmm. so how do the young people can benefit uh, most out of this whole opportunity? Your perspectives. I, I, I believe that young people is sort of a bit more poised to accept this sudden transition to virtual, you know, interactions because they've been sort of raised to do that, right? So um, social network and not meeting people for, for uh, a period of time, but then having to exchange content uh, on social media with each other uh, comes more naturally uh, to them. And then the, the amount of good that you can do on that platform is amazing. So one example is it's, it's Ramadan now. And in Indonesia, um, a lot of people, majority of the population observe it. And um, not being able to meet each other or to do prayers or to bring mm. class together, uh, that kind of communal culture is hard for people. So mm. then yeah. the question is, how do we help? Um, you know, one thing that people usually do is go around uh, during iftar or um, when you break the fast, um, you know, giving meals to those in need. So now you can't go around um, giving, um, you know, handing people uh, their meals. So then what can you do? One idea is um, a, a big um, a big thing here is uh, online courier or uh, deliveries through your app. So then there's one idea about why don't you just order uh, something from the restaurant and have the courier pick it up, but then give the food to the courier and tell them not to drop it up at your destination. So then people just do that collectively. You know, imagine well, a thousand people doing that. That's a thousand people fed and the restaurants and the local businesses get to keep their business uh, alive in this time. So that's the, one of the ingenuity, I think, of using technology for doing good uh, within the limitations. So can you can you use this courier service to send food to Pakistan as well? Well, you, <laughs> we use, uh, I don't mind using the term. So uh, in Indonesia, there's a big ride hailing service that's uh, local. And we also use Grab. I don't know if uh, Pakistan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. then if, if that's a, if I, that's an alternative, grab food certainly allows you to do that. You just order the food and then you tell the driver that the food is for them. Oh, wow. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, where, where we are heading to, what's going to be the future of this uh, webinars, online learning? Uh, you know, where is the whole learning thing going forward? Where do you see six months, a year down the road, uh, you know, the trainers, educators, all these people, what they will be doing? So what is the outlook in, from your vantage point, Mark? I think there'll be a heightened awareness of what we were all forced to quickly adapt and understand some of its advantages uh, and its benefits. I think in the future, with more time, we've got abilities to finesse, there will be a more true blended learning experience. You know, there's no doubt we'll still have schools where kids turn up and there'll be teachers at the front of the room and so on. But I think we'll be able to heighten the use of other technologies in a much better way than paying lip service to it as we had in the past. Um, and, and, and the other thing too is that there's many businesses out there recognizing lots and lots of problems at the moment and they are busy from an entrepreneurial perspective looking to solve some of these uh, problems as well. Um, uh, and so in some ways I wish I had shares in Zoom, for example, three months ago because that would have been a great investment. No one saw this coming necessarily. Um, so Zoom even had to innovate. You know, they didn't really change their product, but they had to find things that were more secure and then offer all sorts of new bells and whistles that were helping people. So for me, the future is a truly blended environment. Um, and importantly, a, a greater understanding that connections, though that building those social relationships is still critical. You, you can still have a group turn up in person. And if you don't have any intention to help build relationships in that space. It's just the same as if you had people on a remote location, you know, talking to each other through video. You still have to bring intentionality. When in doubt, be human. You know, so that stuff still needs to be nurtured and developed. And, and the science is really clear about this, that the most successful programs, and programs I'm using in the general sense of the word, not just those that turn up in person, but also those online. Yeah. The most successful programs in the world are those which intentionally build trusting and healthy relationships. Um, and, you know, I could go in for hours and hours on other webinars talking about the yeah. science and evidence behind that stuff. But that, for me, is the future of learning, is that we really grasp our role as facilitating those human connections, even when we're not in the same room. Amazing. Uh, wonderful. Tika, you know, uh, you must be in touch with your clients and uh, your associates, your competitors. How do you see this market, uh, the leadership development industry um, going forward? And what will be the b- next big thing post COVID where the whole industry will take refuge? So what is your take on this whole conversation? Uh, I will, if I may, answer that in two layers. Number one is the leadership. What does the uh, immediate future of leadership learning looks like, but also learning in general. So let me start with learning in general. So uh, I think a few of the technologies that we've seen already ongoing will only get better, uh, echoing what Mark said. Uh, Virtual reality and augmented reality and algorithms uh, matching between content and, uh, you know, your personal preferences. I think those three key drivers are going to be very, very strong um, because they suddenly had to go very strong. So all three of those will greatly enhance your learning experience individually and communally. So, you know, like the picture that Mark has painted before, imagine that if everyone has VR goggles, which are becoming much, much more affordable nowadays, you know, you're able to still conduct a very strong outdoor group exercise, or in my case, in-classroom exercise where we might do um, you know, some crisis simulation that would be much easier to do with mm. VR and a little bit with uh, augmented reality uh, would be useful in that too. Yep. Um, and then algorithms would just be, you know, people are realizing that there's so much sources of learning nowadays, you might get overwhelmed because there's too many things to learn from. So then what you need is a matching algorithm, sort of what Facebook or Instagram or any social media is doing is that they match you with it. So imagine it's think of it as exactly like a social media, except it's a learning platform. So instead of other people's posts, it's micro learning 
given to you by accredited institutions. So what you consume in that platform, they can then yeah. recommend similar material with similar lengths. That's the kind mm -hmm. of future of the learning that, that I foresaw. Now with me, I actually see me being glass half empty, I actually see um, there's going to be a great resistance about what leadership learning mm -hmm. looks like. People would say, you know, who has time to learn leadership nowadays? Um, yeah. And again, I realize that it may come from my bias, uh, being a you know glass half empty kind of person. But I always welcome resistance to learning leadership. I feel like everyone has always been resistant to learn leadership because they don't know what a leader. They don't have a clear idea of what a good leader looked like in in their time. And certainly now, it's very unclear about what good leadership looks like in this time. So that mm. fear, I think, step one. Uh, and the key for educators is just to move, shift that fear into the question of, okay, how do we become good leaders in this uh, in, in this era? So once you get to that first question of how do you become that, that's when the learning can start. Hmm. I, I think another good uh, metaphor or example, Samad, uh, based yeah. on to, to to answer your question is uh, entertainment. This would be something that young people can, can immediately connect to. When the advent of the video <laughs> recorder, uh, VHS, beta, and now, of course, streaming services, we thought it was the death of the movie uh, the movie cinemas. Uh, yes. We thought the same thing when e-books came out, that all of the bookstores would die. But in all of those cases, they just met a different need. There was a need that was being need uh, recognised. And if you truly want to go and have that human experience of having 300 people in the room all laugh at the same joke, you can't get that at home. You have yeah. to go to a cinema. Uh, if you want to ask someone about their review of a book, you've got to go to a bookstore and get someone's body language, not to mention just their words when they describe it to you. So it's not looking to replace one or the other. It's just meeting a new need. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, talking about book, I have uh, this question in my uh, mind a quick answer do you think mark and tika are people reading and buying more books these days or not oh that's a great question if if, if i'm any gauge uh definitely i think there's more i think people are still buying books because personally i love the the sensual experience of having it between my page uh, in my hand yeah the same I, I, same is I with me same, yeah uh, same as well. yeah and you know, screen exhaustion is real. You know, your eyes get tired looking at a screen all day long. So sometimes you just need to hold, to look at something that's non-electronic. Yep. The batteries never die on a book. They always, they're always there. You don't have to recharge it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, you know, I, I never had the attended or completed any, uh, any online course. Uh, I had enrolled in many uh, courses multiple times, uh, but somehow because of uh, perhaps my my nature, I can't spend a lot of time on the screen. So I, I, I couldn't complete any course in the last 10 years. But this is for the first time that, you know, I brought in that commitment uh, there that, that for the first time I completed an online course and uh, I went uh, across all those available platforms and I had identified my personal developmental needs. That these are the areas because I should use this opportunity to you know, refresh my skills, my knowledge, my expertise, my competence. So, and based on those, I search different courses, and then uh, now I'm doing continuously different courses to upgrade myself. And I was amazed by my own this ability uh, to have this concentration, which I never had in the past. Hmm. So, what are those uh, different tools and platforms uh, these days available, uh, especially to learn online? I mean, I know some of them like Coursera and these uh, kind of platforms that offer uh, free learning or paid learning or very minimal uh, paid learning. I had experienced this LinkedIn learning. This is such a wonderful tool. So uh, we, can you just throw some names of uh, um, many options and uh, alternatives to learning? Hmm. This may be uh, easier for you to answer first, Tika. Happy, happy to. So. Um... It's also worth noting that even with Coursera and uh, uh, EDX, that's usually how I pronounce it, I'm not sure if it's EDX or edX, but yeah. even within those two, um, the variety of content is so wide that you might get overwhelmed. 
Um, I certainly feel overwhelmed. And actually, just like you, Samad, you, during this pandemic time is the first time I've ever completed an online course. A course was learning how to learn. So that yeah. tells you a lot about, I mean, in a way, we've or, we're already changing. Um, you know, if people like you and I can suddenly exhibit this behavioral change, like it or not, that's actually a sign that the future of learning is already here and we're already adapting to it. Mm. So mm -hmm. other uh, sources would be uh, Udemy, uh, U mm. and then D E M Y, uh, Khan Academy, of course. Mm. Uh, Google has recently launched something called a Digital Garage, uh, which is a a pretty good and mostly free, you know, short learning. Um, I, I I'm a strong believer in this. So I'll say this again, but remember that um, your learning can be in any kind of medium. So if you, you can learn a lot from podcasts or if you're not the kind that has the patience to read a book, you can download an audio book version. You can watch documentaries. Uh, Netflix has actually released some of their educational content and documentaries on Netflix, YouTube. So if you search Netflix on YouTube and go to their official channel, you'll be able to see some of their documentaries. You know, what is the stock market? You know, um, use 11 minutes of your time to learn about what the stock market looks like. Um, and then for a variety of other content, I also like openculture.com because they're really the database of everything that's free uh, on the internet, whether it's recorded lectures, writing tips, or even a syllabus, um, you know, of writing syllabus by uh, famous authors. So those are just some of can you the, the name of this, uh, this platform again. What's the name of this platform? The last one is openculture.com. So open mm -hmm. is an open, open culture. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, Mark, uh, we are heading towards the last 10 minutes of this conversation. So uh, would you mind focusing a bit more on playmio.com? So what a learner can get from your website if you, if you visit there? Yeah. So Playmio exists uh, particularly for people who are motivated to use group games and activities to help people connect. That That's what we do. So all of the group games and activities, everything from a simple icebreaker to a substantive team event, uh, can be found on Playmio. Uh, there's a free app. It's completely free. There's no in-app purchases, so I'm never going to know about you. Just go to your favorite uh, app marketplace and plug in Playmio, which is seven characters, P-L-A-Y-M-E-O. You can see it on the screen as well, um, and download the app. That curates all of our free content, and we're committed to having a substantial amount of our premium content available for free for people who just look into kick the tires or the they're uh, the receptionist who's been asked to run an icebreaker before the next staff meeting or a youth group leader who, you know, has just stepped up to the role and wants to run some get to know you activities. So they're all available. And most powerfully, they come with a video tutorial. Uh, that is most people these days in a YouTube generation would prefer to watch a three minute video of a real group being led on the activity than read 500 words of instructions. So uh, yep, so knock yourself out. Check out the app. That's free to uh, download. You can go to the desktop version of Playmio.com. Um, and if people are interested and feel that this is something they'd like to be a part of, there are books and resources and trainings available. But by far the most powerful access to the resources is to become a member. If you become a member of the exclusive club, uh, use the code COVID-19, no dashes, just COVID-19, covid one nine. And that'll give you any of our annual plans, a uh, 50% discount. And so that would be a great way for young people, at a, you know, particularly at the moment where money is tight, uh, to get full access to the entire database as well. So thank you so much. I'm happy to share that with your viewers and listeners. And, uh, you know, generally, I'm very much admirer of your this website because I've been stealing a lot of your uh, games and activities uh, for my team building and uh, my program. Especially, I love that uh, jump in, jump out, that you stay in the circle. And <laughs> it is a viral activity. It's had, oh, I forget, four or five million uh, views now. Uh, and that's yeah. just one of over 400 activities that we've got. So that happens to be a free one. But, yeah, many, many other activities out there. So thanks for the opportunity to share that. Excellent. Uh, I definitely uh, invite all the viewers to have a look at this uh, website. This is a wonderful platform and uh, Mark will be very generous. You know, I always think that how do the, uh, the trainers who are into uh, commercial learning uh, could put their uh, blood and sweat uh, for the benefit of public. And this is such a great gesture. And this is where I believe that, you know, this is how the learning has to be. The learning uh, is a basic right of every human like 
water and food and air. So um, those we those people who are blessed uh, to be an educator or a trainer or you know we have got this responsibility to pass on uh, this knowledge and experience because uh, I believe that we also have got it from somewhere from someone. So uh, this is how we have to pass on the legacy. So Tika. Uh, uh, concluding, concluding this session and uh, coming to the last few minutes, do you have any specific uh, cool tips or advices um, or your closing message for the young people around the world? How they can, you know, develop or improve themselves? How they can have more learning, um, especially in these times? Yeah, uh, I think I think my message is that this may be uh, clear for some and not for others. Is that you don't learn from knowledge, you learn by reflecting from knowledge. So when you're consuming all the content that you're consuming, you, that's great, but you have to spend the time to internalize it. And however you do that, you should do it in any way you feel comfortable in doing. Uh, so that's number one, uh, spend time reflecting from what you consume. And number two is, you know, when you, when this is over and you look back at this time, the question you would want to ask yourself and other people is not what did you do or what did you learn? I mean, those will be the questions that you have to have answers ready for. But really the bigger question is what, what kept you going? How did you get through this? You know, Sama, the question for you is congratulations for finishing an online course. How did you do it differently this time? What, what changed that you're suddenly able mm. to do? That? Mm. So that kind of learning would be very useful for you in the future, especially given that we will have a lot more uh, ad adaptations uh, to to foresee. Uh, interesting. Uh, not just learn, but also reflect on that, and then ask yourself that you know how you did it and how you can keep doing it, how you can continue this spirit of learning. Uh, I mean, to you, Mark, for your concluding remarks. Uh, I will concur with what I just heard. Uh, what we just uh, heard Tika say was the essence of experiential learning. We need a lot more people to step up to facilitate those those learning experiences, no matter what medium they are. We have enough people teaching, but that's not the same as learning. And so to invite people through processes to help them reflect on what they've learned is actually where learning occurs. So take those opportunities where you can. Uh, interesting, wonderful. So take those opportunities uh, wherever you can. Uh, you know, these are amazing insights from my these uh, wonderful guests from Indonesia and uh, Australia who dedicated their one hour for the learning of young people at Youth Impact and across the uh, platform, uh, YouTube and Facebook. You know, in our religious uh, Islamic uh, um, uh, writing, it says that loser is the one uh, whose today is not better than yesterday. Loser is the one whose today is not better than yesterday, which actually emphasizes on our continuous improvement you know continuous improvement to the extent of every day learning something new uh, leaving some bad habit or adding something uh, good into your uh, lifestyle into your personality into into your whole life so this is a continuous process of learning and uh, we have to learn from the time of birth till the last uh, you know breath so this is, this is something as a human being we are meant to do. And this is what my guests had been here to highlight uh, and share some tools and methodologies, some platforms, uh, some uh, uh, very useful tips that, you know, how young people can reflect on learning, how young people can use this time wisely, how using this time uh, to build connections, uh, to be good human. Uh, to connect with yourself, connect with your family members, connect with your community members, connect with, with your far relatives and connect with your own creator. So this whole spectrum of connectivity is, uh, I think, uh, the best uh, outcome of uh, this entire uh, experience of COVID-19. So thank you very much, uh, Mark and uh, Tika, for your wonderful insights. I'm sure we'll uh, learn more from you guys. Uh, stay blessed, stay happy, take good care of yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much.